Hello everyone. Today we got a really, really exciting episode for you guys. If you like how Tesla always talks about autonomy, full self-driving, the electronics behind it, the AI behind it, maybe you watched um, Tesla Autonomy Day, right? Tesla Autonomy Investor Day. Uh, if you find that as fascinating as I do, then you're gonna love this video. Basically, when it comes to full self-flying, there are about 100 companies developing uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, commonly referred to as eVTOLs. But there are only a handful of companies actually developing the AI for them. And one of the leaders in this field is a company in Switzerland called Didelian. In this video, we interview them and they told us some really fascinating info about how full self-flying compares to full self-driving, the differences, the similarities, uh, the technical aspects of it, uh, and how long it's gonna take. In any case, here are the different segments for the video. Uh, as well as the timestamps, and there is a clickable version in the comments below. I'm sure you guys will love the video. Have fun. So, basically, uh, in layman's term, Dedalene is trying to make an autopilot for drones, eVTOL devices, uh, helicopters and you guys are a lot more sophisticated. So currently the industry standard would be something like this uh, DJI drone, it has some sensors, some basic obstacle avoidance. What makes Dedalene different? So the, dr the drone that you have is a, uh, what we call an open category drone. It, is, it works, it's less than 25 kilograms. It works up to 120 meters above uh, ground. It also should be flown only in line of sight and not beyond visual line of sight. And such drones are normally hobby drones or kind of industrial drones, but really they're limited in terms of what, what you can do with them, at least legally. <laughs> what we try to do at Idealin is we want to enable the big heavy drones with, which carry people, uh, or which carry very, very precious cargo to, to be flown. And what this means, you need much higher, the error margin is much, much, much smaller. So you really need to ensure these things don't crash. If you crash your small DJI, sure, you've lost $1,000. Maybe you hit someone, worst case, you know, hopefully not. Uh, but, you know, we haven't killed big anyone. Big lawsuit. Exactly. Maybe you had a lawsuit, but, but, you know, it wouldn't be a big one. And we're also working with YASA, and the, which is the European Aviation Safety Agency, and yeah. such authorities to ensure that we, we do this uh, safely and appropriately. And I think you guys also do some work with the FAA, right? Uh, yes, we have been in touch with the FAA as well. But uh, pro pro the currently the kind of the only thing like on paper, yeah. uh, not just not just words, not just hot air, is yeah. that we have an innovation partnership contract with YASA mm -hmm. to develop design assurance concepts for neural networks, and that will be coming out in January 2020. The first report out of this. So, uh, so what we want to ensure is that our algorithms run reliably, that they run safely and certifiably. And so uh, we also work with regulators, uh, appropriate regulators to enable this, so to make sure the algorithms and our systems are certifiable for manned aircraft, not just for small drones. So autonomous vehicles, like for example, Tesla and so on, they are currently somewhere around 90% uh, effective, 95% effective working all, out all the corner cases. They have like hundreds of thousands of cars on the road now to get, gather all that information. But I'm guessing the problems they face are very different from what you guys are facing. So how far is, along is, are you guys in this industry? So if, in percentage numbers, in years, any kind of figure? Oh, okay. So uh, we would say, I think, <laughs> I, think the, I think the number we're currently quoting is 2026, kind of the autopilot uh, technology, at least in, uh, in the flying uh, market. And that is because, I mean, you have lots of these vehicles already, as you say, hundreds of thousands of cars of Teslas on the road. Yeah, we don't have the luxury just yet of having hundreds of thousands of cars on tap for data to use as a massive data server. So what we do is we have our own internal simulator, uh, which we use in, what, like I say, different ways to train and also to verify our neural networks. For now, we just gather all the data that we can, and we hopefully one day, once these air taxis take off, pun intended, and then don't just hover around and uh, once they become a real thing, we will, with our, all of our systems mounted, we'll end up in the Tesla situation where we also have maybe not hundreds of millions and millions of vehicles, but at least that's not what the current prognosis says, but you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of vehicles, hundreds of thousands of vehicles to gather the data from. 
a lot of these uh, air taxi companies they're still doing their first hovers and their first kind of flights around yeah. so, so you know it's completely practical now to talk about uh, you know 95 percent of all corner cases at the moment because we haven't actually found out all the corner cases yet we have obviously we have some testing errors etc so i would say um maybe you know 2026 i think is what the current uh, aim is you see you guys probably have two numbers one like for how well it works to avoid obstacles in the air and how well it works for trying to land right what are the, how far along are you in those two categories those two fields yep so what we try to do for now is meet the human meet and exceed what a human can do for example in terms of detect and avoid or obstacle avoidance uh, of other airborne aircraft a human they say roughly speaking would take to aim for 12 and a half seconds to before he spots it to actually doing an avoidance maneuver so what we try and do is ensure, for example, that we can actually also see the Cessna coming at us within 12 and a half seconds to roughly speaking right now, we're aiming at, let's say, a 99%. Within the next six months, we're aiming at a 99% rate of doing this. Um, for landing site finder, again, the problem there is different. Rather than making sure you avoid the thing, you actually want to make sure you don't land onto something that's actually not landable. Yeah. And again, we're kind of aiming in the upper 90%. Uh, but really for aerospace standards, at the end for the full autopilot uh, we're talking right so any of these conditions where you can end up with a loss of the aircraft such as if you collide with someone or maybe you collide with the ground you need to prove that it's 10 to the minus 9 in terms of uh, 10 to the minus 9 means once in every 10 to the minus 9 flying hours this would this would occur yeah that's the, like, all, like how large is that number like 1 billion yeah, <laughs> 1 billion flying hours and then you have uh, not not that complex we have full tree analyses and safety analyses to get you there so normally it's a thing where you do multiple failure modes combined together and yeah you get into a lot more technicalities now it's just not worth it but that's kind of the things that we look at so a quick explanation before the next question um tcas is a system that uh, most airplanes use to avoid crashes so basically pilots in both cockpits here either climb climb or descend descend and then they have about 10 seconds to quickly do that to avoid the crash but in the dense air traffic uh, of the future with like drones and eVTOLs, will that be enough? Uh, because that is line of sight, but what about beyond line of sight? Like for example, large commercial aircraft, they use uh, TCAS, CCAS to warn them, but that doesn't really work when it's gonna be like so much more traffic and so much more dense, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that, that's, the, that's the problem with, I think TCAS actually works fairly well, but it's not designed for these operations that we, we're targeting ultimately. Really, if you want to have urban air taxi at scale you, means you know tens of thousands of aircraft above uh, let's say LA uh, flying around per hour yeah. and, and that uh, TCAS is not really designed for uh, it's designed for generous separation between aircraft let's put it that way and with our technology this enable with our technology the aim is to get this to be much tighter so because we have employee because we see other aircraft right if we do this really well we, we see and feel and perceive other aircraft and obstacles we can, once we connect all these aircraft together, we can build up this really good map and understanding of the world uh, through the UTM and, sorry, the unmanned traffic management uh, systems and really get these nice, nicely tight together. Because from our system, you know where you are based on the vision and literally the vision, the camera, and uh, you know from the other aircraft where, uh, where the other aircraft is, you can then combine via vehicle to vehicle communications combine the, these data streams into a, a giant kind of state estimator model and uh, you can really understand the movement of the different aircraft and you can gain very good confidence about what might happen it almost start maybe even start predicting when problems before they even occur so for in terms of congestion in terms of potential collisions just ahead of time what we enable with the camera is basically having the human pilot onto your airframe so we're able to spot aircraft without a transponder also birds also drones and such things which you can also potentially collide with so this is how our system is better than TCAS and this is how you can ensure that you can have these uh, dense urban networks of EV tolls around the cities so basically if a bird is seen flying uh, one of the flying uh, EV tool devices will record it and let all the others know about that bird basically let's say would it also track its, uh, you know, which direction it's heading and extrapolate yep. its uh, future, you know? Ex yeah, exactly. So we can do, okay. so maybe a bird, individual bird, might not be that much of a problem, but a large drone or a flock of birds 
for example. So, you know, we can, if you track where the flock is going, you can warn the rest in advance. Because, again, that's how you pick up. You normally detect and you start tracking, and say tracking, not necessarily even as a radar algorithm, but just tracking in the sense of estimating where it is and, make, and gain, gaining confidence in that this is a flock of birds and it's a threat and it's kind of moving in a direction that can threaten me or the others around me. Quick explanation before the next question again. RVSM is another system for avoiding crashes where basically your cruising altitude is determined by your heading. And this worked great for avoiding crashes, but the thing is airplanes are only allowed to descend in specific airspace around the airport. But in the future, if your house is the destination, what then? Yeah, because uh, about traffic management, I mean, right now, like what we, something like RVSM wouldn't really work for eVTOL devices, right? Uh, yeah, because, well, it, it would work, but just wouldn't work at maximum scale to enable... Uh, How are you guys looking about going around that problem? Um, so the, the main thing that I think one of, the, one of the ideas that we have is obviously people are quite keen on vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I'm echoing the words of the founder here. Uh, you, you, can't, you, you can do vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication and you can get into a lot of detail with this, but fundamentally it comes down to the fact that you want to see other aircraft and be seen by the aircraft. This is why the ideally start with the cameras on board the aircraft, do everything on the edge. And the idea there is that if, you, if I see you coming at me and I see an obstacle or I see a landing spot and then my system is replicated on all the other aircraft flying around this dense space, you can build up a state of the world. You can easily build up this thing that the UTM and the current radar and the current um, uh, ATC air traffic control does. And you can basically allow things to be, as you get more data as you get, and as these things communicate, Sorry, as you, as you get the data from all, from all the aircraft and put it together into a, this giant state estimator model, you, you're allowed to bring these uh, margins closer together. So it's like a collective state estimation of what your world looks like. And again, you can combine this with the current radar and such technologies, but, but, but this gets yeah, because a really you guys are radical. almost uh, done with vision and soon going to be adding new sensor, right? Like, yep. what's next? Like, infra you said something about infrared already partially being done and next, what was it, radar or something? Um, we, yes, we, we want to start with vision because it's what the pilots currently do as well and it basically means you can fly in visual meteorological, meteorological conditions, which is VMC. Now, in order to push, push our envelope a bit more, uh, the current sensors that we use uh, do have some receptance to IR. We're looking at maybe uh, introducing this in the next couple of months into our algorithms. But the key one uh, we think next would be radar for us where we, uh, when you have slightly lower visibility or you have bad weather, everyone thinks they're very smart when they say, oh, what happens in fog? Well, human pilots don't fly to frog, th through fog right now, <laughs> right? So what we're gonna do is add some radar and uh, to really push the performance and to mix it in at the lowest level with our cameras, at the lowest level of the algorithms. And ultimately, for the real corner cases, one, we will probably add a couple of long wave IR cameras, infrared cameras. And we're not looking at radar, uh, uh, LiDAR and we, uh, at the moment uh, because we think we can achieve all of the functionality without it. But we'll, we will test it and see. We, you know, we're not completely excluding it, but we don't want to base our algorithms fundamentally on it because we think it's a bit too expensive and it's a bit uh, not, not necessarily required. So what kind of regulatory hurdles are you seeing right now? So... I wouldn't call them necessarily hurdles. So, in fact, we at Dialium we've signed a contract with YASA, which is the European Aviation uh, Aviation Safety Agency, to develop design assurance concepts for neural networks. And uh, what this is is we what we try to do with YASA together, and they're very enthusiastic about this, and they really want to learn about this. They want to move as fast as they can because obviously generally regulation, you know, regulators have this. Uh, bad stigma that you know they move a bit slowly politics can be slow exactly uh, and regulators themselves can also be but you know in this case they're very very excited to work with us to develop these concepts because they want to get them into aviation and they're very excited that we're coming we're coming then going no, no no this is not a black box with f magic underneath this is something you can crack open look inside and see how uh, actually verifiable and see how verifiable it actually can be really i, I think the main kind of hurdle, if you like, is that just there aren't any, for example, rules to certify neural networks. 
specific aerospace use cases, specific networks, the way they train, the way they process uh, inputs into the output, you can actually show to some extent how, that they're verifiable and that they, can, they are deterministic. There's other ways which are just kind of annoying because, for example, we can't use certain hardware or your source code, for example, you know, one of the things is we can't use video, for example, hardware at the moment, because because the CUDA drivers are closed source. Oh, you mean NVIDIA, I'm sorry. NVIDIA, sorry, yeah. NVIDIA, uh, because the CUDA drivers are closed source. So if you know, it's a hurdle because the regular... And it's not uh, certified for aviation technology, right? So it's certified in the sense you can mount it onto an airframe and do processing. Uh, you know, as long as it doesn't explode and kill anyone, that's fine. But you can't make safe critical decisions with it because you cannot prove to the regulator that, you know, because I tweaked that bit, that bit came out. You know, this is what sets apart from a DJI, as you said, to answer your earlier question, is we can't just use any hardware from the street, the, sorry, from the, from the shop. We you have to use very specific hardware, which has enough documentation, enough evidence to show that you can carry people with it. And because we need to prove that our, you know, this bit, flipping this bit on, flips that other bit on, etc. We need to prove it down to this, the, the lowest level that everything works as, as intended. And these are kind of not heard, but these are kind of the challenges of doing aviation grade stuff. So you guys have been experience, experimenting with uh, turning off the GPS, uh, GPS outages. Tell me some more about that. Yeah, so GPS, this is basically the only kind of sensor that gives you position, absolute, some position relative to some frame in the world. If it drops out, you need to gain control of this drone, and that's normally with a remote control of some sort, remote link. What we do is we actually use the camera stream to navigate. It means uh, you can rely, you have two dissimilar systems at play inside the aircraft, which means it makes it safer. It's fundamentally safer because if one drops out, you have the other. And it, this is how you get to these uh, high aerospace grade, 10 to the minus nine, one in a billion hours failures, failure rates. And we're working to make this what we call the visual GPS, where we're, we're able th through some landmark recognition. I don't. I can't. First, I don't fully. You know, f because I'm not the guy who's like two, looking at this. Two guys driving circles, saying, "Hey, I recognize that tree." <laughs> yeah, if you like, it's kind of like a very minimal kind of a database, but it's not. I think they're going to kill me for saying database as a word, <laughs> but kind of a, a way to basically tell where you are in this in this world. And what why this is very powerful is because you are currently at the level of GPS in terms of functionality, to basically help you gain an absolute position in the world. Thank you so much for your time. It's Thank you. It's been great uh, talking to you. Thank you very much. Personally, I learned a lot about AI and autonomy from the guys at Didelian, and big thanks to you guys for the cool info. Um, if you guys have any questions, please leave them down below in the comments. We'll try to answer everything we can. Anything we don't know, we will ask Didelian and get back to you down in the comments. Um, if you like this video and think more people should see it, then uh, please give this video a thumbs up. And other than that, have a nice day. Till next time.